So hi, I'm Adam. Uh, I'm at IBM Research, and this is work done with Yoshi Krauss at NYU, a PhD student there, and Kenny Ng, who's a colleague with me at IBM. Uh, and I'm going to be talking, as he said, about trying to make these predictions a little bit more interactive. I think some of this follows uh, nicely uh, after uh, Dr. Friedman's talk this morning. Um, and we're actually going to be leveraging uh, partial dependence, which was one of the uh, topics that he discussed earlier. But I'll kind of review that in a bit. Um, to make this a little bit more concrete, I'm going to talk about a uh, a project that we're applying predictions to that's very fresh. We're working with some ecologists at, uh, at the Cary Institute in New York that are trying to actually predict uh, uh, Zika virus in primates. Uh, for those of you unaware, uh, the that's how kind of Zika spreads to us is monkeys have it first, it kind of doesn't affect them, so they continue to survive, and they just kind of pass it on generation to generation. And then what happens, of course, is then mosquitoes bite it's the primates, then the same mosquitoes bite us, and then we get Zika. And so we're going to kind of use this as an illustration of how we can kind of start to understand predictions. Now, I'll just kind of don't walk away with any conclusions here about what you see in this talk. It's very fresh, and we're still cleaning the data and stuff. But I just, uh, it was an active project, and I kind of wanted to just use it as, a, as an illustration. Um, if you go and read the paper that's in the proceedings, we actually apply this work to a different use case. Uh, we apply it with uh, predicting the onset of diabetes from medical records. So if that's of interest to you, check out the paper. You can read more about that and how we had some actual data scientists using the tool to do that. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about Zika. And so here's just a, a kind of a, an illustrative data set. So we have a bunch of uh, uh, primates. Um, some of them we know are Zika carriers currently. Some of them are not. And we have a lot of uh, features about them, right? How much do they weigh? Um, when do they typically give birth? Um, how long do they gestate? How long? What is their social group size? Are they exposed to rain? Things like this. So we have tons and tons, dozens and dozens of variables. And we, what we want to do is we want to build a predictive model to predict, OK, can we kind of learn, um, can we predict which primates might uh, be uh, reservoirs for Zika in the future? So we can maybe, the reason why they want it, the ecologists want to do this is it's very hard to eradicate mosquitoes, but it might be easier to eradicate the mosquitoes around possible Zika carriers. So um, that's kind of the motivation here. So if we follow a typical standard predictive pipeline where we you know, define the cohorts correctly, construct the features we want, do cross-validation for robustness, um, run some fancy feature selection algorithms to find the most informative features, and then run some fancy classifiers to, to, to build our model, um, we can you know, get a predictive model with a high accuracy. And our ecologist colleagues are very happy about this, that we can get you know, a 0.9 AUC or something like this, and they're very happy. But of course, the next question that comes about is the interpretability, right? They will kind of understand, OK, what is this model actually telling us? If we're going to spend some resources to try to you know, eradicate some mosquitoes around these primates you're predicting, you know, we should probably have some understanding of what's going on in the model. And if, you know, and if we just tell them, well, it's this complex statistical methods that it's really hard to interpret, and it's kind of like a black box, they're not so happy, right? Um, so really, the, the, the goal of this work is to come up with some interactive techniques to um, probe what's going on in the data. Um, and so a typical way of kind of probing a predictive model is something that, um, you know, again, you show a kind of a bar chart of variable importance, right, where you kind of uh, show the top features according to the variable importance metric that show you that are the most predictive. Um, and this is kind of really the, the, the starting point for most people when they try to communicate their findings from predictive models. Um, and you can learn some really interesting information about what are the most important features and how they contribute and so on. Um, but often they want to do more. Maybe they want to go beyond that. They actually want to understand how each of the values of each of these features impact the prediction. Or maybe they even want to go further and they start want to actually, you know, playing with the model to test different hypotheses that they have. Um, and so that's what we're going to get over here. Uh, and we're going to leverage for the first part of this partial dependence for this. Um, and it was brought up earlier in the, in the initial keynote, but I'll just kind of give you like a 30-second primer on what it is in case you're unfamiliar. But again, we have all this data about these various primates. Um, and we have, a, we have the model already built. And we're happy with the accuracy of this model. Um, so right now, we're predicting that these left four uh, primates are having the Zika virus, the possible carriers for that, and the right four are not. So we can see that at the bottom here. Um, and what we're going to do is, for partial dependence, is we're going to play with the feature that we care about. In this case, we're going to start with body mass. And we're going to say, OK, let's keep all the other features of these primates the same, but we're actually going to change uh, the body mass for all these features and set them all to one specific value. So we're going to set them all to 5. And if we set all of these primates to now be 5 kilograms, we can see, does the prediction change? So we feed in all of these new primates that are all 5 kilograms into the model. We see what comes out. And in this illustrative example, now the predictions have changed. Now we're only getting the left two being predicted with Zika, and the right six are not. And so we can kind of plot that partial dependence here on the right. 
Again, let's try a different value like 25 kilograms, see what happens. Now the left five get predicted as having Zika, the right three don't, and so on. And so you can do this for all the different ranges until you get the plot that you like. Um, and so this is what a partial dependence plot is uh, in a nutshell. And we're going to leverage this and make this interactive as a part of the tool. And I'll, and I'll show you a demo of that uh, in just a bit. Um, the other part we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to interactively probe the model and start playing with values. And one of our inspirations was actually, I don't know if, how many of you have seen it, but it's a nice feature on the New York Times where it's kind of this rent versus buy calculator where basically you can play with all these different variables about home price and how you, long you plan to live there and interest rate and HOA fees and all this stuff. And it'll kind of give you an idea of if you should um, rent or rent for a certain price or, or buy if it's, the rent's going to cost you more than that. And it's nicely interactive in this kind of this prediction or this value of, uh, of uh, what the monthly rate is kind of changes with every little maneuver you do. And of course, this is a very simple model that's just all you know, linear algorithms. But, but nonetheless, it was kind of served as inspiration for what we wanted to provide, which we're calling a localized inspection. So again, here we have a particular primate. Um, we have a bunch of features about this primate. Um, and we want to kind of turn each of these features into a, a slider, if you will. So what we're going to actually do is is make them into a slider and allow the users to start kind of tweaking the different values. So we could maybe drag down the age of birth for this particular primate to see how the model would respond. And in this hypothetical example, the prediction goes down. Or we can drag up the social group size and see that and see how the prediction affects as well. Um, so that's kind of the idea that we wanted to do. Um, and the way we do that is we kind of compress this partial dependence plot that I just explained into these kind of uh, scented sliders, if you will, that where blue means low risk, red means high risk. And it kind of gives you a clue that if you were to drag this slider to the left, the risk would go down for this particular uh, prediction and drag and so on. Um, so that's kind of the basics. So now I'll just kind of briefly show you how the tool works interactively. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then we'll um, conclude. So one of the first parts of the tool is just very simple, just making pr uh, partial dependence a little bit more interactive. So again, this view is very kind of simple and typical to what you would do if you were just plotting this in, in, in R. But essentially, we have a list of variables here. Again, this data is messy, so the names aren't very readable right now. But I've selected this uh, adult body mass variable that I've alluded to in the slides. And we can actually see with the partial dependence that as weights go higher, the risk goes higher as well. So we see this kind of increase. Um, what's actually interesting is that there's also this kind of little nook at the, the top where there's actually these primates that are very, 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 very small. I didn't know they existed, but those also have somewhat of a high risk prediction, so that's kind of interesting as well. But if we ignore those for now, we can kind of see that there's pretty strong correlation between you know, the weight going up and the risk score going up. And so we can kind of start playing around with all these different variables and see. We can look at other variables. So for instance, this one, um, which has a complicated name, but basically you can think of it as correlating to precipitation. So the more wet the area is, um, the, the higher the number will be. And here we can actually see there's an inverse correlation where you know these the, where the drier, um, the monkeys, the, the primates that live in a, a drier area are less likely to have Zika than the ones that get higher. So again, you can play with this and see the interactive uh, partial dependence which is nice. But of course, we wanted to also do this interactive uh, probing on the model. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to this particular panel here, and I'm going to select a primate of interest. So we organize all the primates according to are the controls the ones that don't have Zika, are the cases the ones that do. Um, I don't have time to explain the whole interface, but basically I can select ones that have predictions of values that I'm interested for. So I'm going to select a primate that um, we believe is uh, a Zika carrier, and right now its prediction score is only about like 0.5, so it's kind of like on the borderline, right? And we can actually select this primate and see all the different features that this primate has, and each of these features, and on the screen the colors are a little hard to see, but, uh, but essentially we can look at things like adult body mass, and if you could kind of make the colors here, you can see that if we were to change this uh, dimension and drag up this weight for this particular feature, which I'll just actually do right here, we're going to actually see the risk score goes up and up and up and up. All the other features change in real time, and we can see that you know our original prediction was 0.52, and if we drag this up, it goes up a little higher. So we can do that. Um, and for instance, if we also would um, change some other variables, like uh, if we would actually change the amount of space that this primate occupies and drag that down, we can see that we can actually lower the, 
the prediction as well. So it lets you kind of start probing. So if you have specific hypotheses that you want to test about the data, um, you can actually kind of interactively do that right there. Um, uh, to make it a little bit uh, easier to search the space, so rather than just dragging uh, sliders and kind of seeing what happens, we can also kind of rank each of the features according to if you wanted to increase the risk or dec decrease the risk of this particular primate. So we could actually click this increased risk button, and now it sorts all the uh, features according to what would be the, the fastest way to increase the risk by moving the least amount of numbers, if you will. Um, so this actually is recommending us to drop down this precipitation variable from uh, this 1.3 to, to this uh, 800.8. Um, so we can click that there, and again, it'll, it'll take us there. And again, it's showing us the partial dependence on the right to see how this affects uh, each other. The, the grayish bar is the one for overall the whole population, and this darker black bar is for this particular primate. So it gives us an idea of how sensitive this um, particular variable is for it. So again, we can start clicking all of these recommendations and start um, making this primate more and more likely to, uh, to be a Zika carrier, if you will. And again, this is just one way to probe what the model is doing so you can get a sense out of uh, a better model. Um, uh, and of course, this isn't necessarily, you know, not all, most of these features you could actually, you know, change on the ground, of course, but it does let you get a sense out of uh, how the model would react to some of your hypotheses. Um, I actually went very fast, so um, I'm actually going to give you some extra time to ask questions, but um, so I'm just going to go to my, my last slide where I just kind of wanted to, the main takeaway is I think there's a really strong uh, role for interactive exploration and visualization in these predictive tasks. Over the past few years, we've worked on a variety of topics in this area where we've tackled different parts of the predictive modeling pipeline, everything from cohort construction to um, coming up with the right feature selection algorithm or classifiers to this prospector work that I just showed today um, for interactive leading. So if those topics are interesting to you, you can check them out on, on my webpage, which is mylastname.org. Um, but again, to conclude, uh, partial dependence, I think, is a powerful tool for kind of debugging and learning and interpreting um, models. Uh, and of course, there's some limitations to partial dependence that were kind of set up for future work. But nonetheless, it's a really nice way to start probing models. Uh, uh, I think this localized inspection stuff for being able to kind of test different hypotheses has been very powerful uh, with the various data scientists we work with. So I think there's some promising things there. And also kind of the way you can rank these kind of most impactful changes and, and show that and demonstrate that to the users has been powerful as well for them kind of becoming more comfortable with uh, with these predictions and as I mentioned uh, there's a case study in the paper where we work with some data scientists clinical researchers working on the prediction of uh, onset of diabetes and so if you read the paper you can actually learn some stories of how this this type of tools were able to kind of make them more confident and actually deploy some of these models in, in, in their actual institutions which is kind of exciting um, so with that I'll wrap up and uh, take any questions thank you Thank you, Adam. Are there any questions? Yes, one moment. We we'll need to do some pathfinding. Um, so I really like this um, this um, continuum between doing exploration on the entire data set versus a subset versus a single instance. Could you say, in your experience with the data scientists, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing this kind of localized inspection? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on, you know, it somewhat depends on the use case, right? Like, often they want to have a model that predicts a large population because they're typically working on lots and lots of things. So they need something that's robust enough to do that. But they also want to be able to kind of test the model. And so maybe they have specific expertise with a particular primate or a particular patient. And they want to kind of understand, is this, is, are the reasons why the prediction is performing well? Do those actually make kind of clinical or ecological sense, right? And then they can kind of use this tool to see, you know, is it's behaving. And, you know, one of the, I mean, one of the, best reasons to use visualization or data exploration in general is to, to find the bugs in your data. And that's typically, you know, you might get a very highly accurate predictive model, but if you start actually digging down to the patient level and seeing what's causing the prediction, they often kind of maybe you imputed the data incorrectly. Maybe there's just some variable that you interpreted, you know, was a different scale than you thought and so on. So it, yeah, it's kind of, it's hard to answer broadly, but it really depends on kind of what the, what the, the data scientist is trying to do, so. What kind of visualization tools did you use to uh, show your model? Uh, so these were all kind of custom built using, uh, I guess, the, the D3 platform is uh, what they were kind of used to, to render the visualization. But, uh, but um, they were kind of just you know, built from scratch, if you will. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I like the way of the interactive uh, investigation of the model and the sensitivity analysis. So, but just now you show that you, when you, you can change the value of some variables, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some variables might have be highly correlated. Do you, do you think about enforce those kind of correlate re relationship among yeah. variables? Right, yeah, so that's one of the weaknesses of partial dependence is you're just looking at it at a single feature and you don't, there's no correlation. So obviously, um, you know, some of the variables in the Zika data set where you have body mass of, of what they grow as a dog and, and, and body mass of when they're born, right? And so those are probably correlated in some way. And right now, you could drag one in one direction and one in the other, and the model would still give you a prediction even though that might not make any biological sense, right? So yeah, so our future work is actually trying to figure out ways to kind of, um, uh, correlate these variables. Uh, in the clinical space, we've we've actually kind of manually done some correlations, but that's of course not scalable to all data sets and everything, but we're trying to um, come up with better techniques. So certainly, um, you know, I come from the, the HCI and visualization part of this community, if you will, but if, you, if any of you are familiar with some techniques that might be um, a way to go beyond partial dependence, I would, I would love to hear, so. Yeah, this is, a, this is very interesting. Thank you. Uh, do you see the benefits of this as being more for uh, comparing, debugging, improving the models, or more for communication, uh, sort of this like rhetorical benefit of, of working with your, your end users, or has that changed for various projects? Yeah, I mean, initially it was really a tool for data scientists to become more comfortable with their models, to make sure that they could get their kind of stakeholders to buy in that the models were really doing what they wanted. So it was kind of a hybrid, I guess. Um, but certainly now we're going down the road of trying to also um, use it more for communication purposes. And so we're starting to rethink how do you kind of restructure the interface to kind of uh, present it in ways that are a little bit more comfortable to people that um, are just may not be data scientist experts, but are just trying to understand what's going on. So that's a great point, And that is also the source of some future work we'll hopefully show you in the future. Yeah. One of the, uh, in approaches like this, I mean, besides the correlational problem, which is a big one, because almost all the data that we analyze is observational. So you really can't move one. You can move one at a time and see how the model changes, but it's not going to move. Uh, it's not going to be realistic of what really happens. The other thing is that I find with, with approaches like this that confuses users is causality. That they think, you know, I'll move this and see what happens. Well, in the real world, uh, we don't need to, our predictive models don't need causality to make predictions, but they can't tell us what happens if we change uh, the 14th variable, what happens to the outcome, because maybe the outcome is causing 14 to change, and uh, nothing's going to happen when you change 14. And so I don't know, how, if you yeah. can figure out a way to deal with yeah. that, I'd love to hear about it. I don't know. And then uh, finally, have you thought about higher dimensional partial dependence plots? So what do you mean by that? I'm, maybe I'm not familiar with uh, that phrase of higher dimension. So, so ones that uh, look at multiple. Yeah, if you're, simultaneously yeah. look at more than ver one variable mm -hmm. at once. Partial dependence plots conditions on one of the variables right. and averages over all the others. You can condition on two. You can yeah. condition on three. Right. And then it, I think it'd be cool to you know be able to move around in the two-dimensional plane right. and, and see things change. Yeah. The one example we've done so far is so we have. For instance, these primates, we have longitude and latitude. So we've done two and kind of overlay that on a map, if you will, so yeah, you can okay. kind of sense. But we haven't gone beyond that. That's an interesting um, uh, topic as yeah, well. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Okay, that wraps up this session. Let's thank the speakers again. Thanks.